Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. A bright and sunny afternoon from Montego Bay, Jamaica. I'm more than delighted to be here with you on Live Echo's presentation for Caribbean Environment Week. And we have a fantastic lineup for you in our Youth in Action section today. So I would like to invite our players onto the webinar with us. Ben, are you there? I am here. Wonderful, lovely. Thank you for zooming in from the Cayman Islands. Deje and Eleanor, wonderful. Look at the fabulous young people we have with us today. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Natasha Parchment Clark, otherwise known as Auntie Tasha. And I am the Director of Training for Training Tree and also an Environmental Sustainability member of the Rotary Action Group. I've been a Rotarian for the past 10 years and I specialize in projects with youth all across Montego Bay and now the Caribbean. So it's my pleasure to introduce the young persons who are the stars of the show today. Um, could we start with our visitors from Cayman? We have Protect Our Future. So Ben, the president, is going to tell us a little bit about the group that he's with. And then DJ is going to tell us a little bit about what she does and what she enjoys about being part of that group. Take it away, Ben. Of course. OK, so Protect Our Future is a fully student run organization. And it's not confined to one school or one group of kids. So our whole image is that we've connected seven or eight various schools around Ireland. And that's ranging from private to public schools as well. So we have a wide demographic of kids that go from probably about grade nine, so like 12, all the way up to senior year and we have people from the local university come in as well and talk to us, which is good. And essentially what we do is we're providing a platform for these local children to seek and pursue their own environmental interests. So if they bring up an issue like overdevelopment with mangroves, then we bring together all of these schools and we work and we create campaigns to fight towards this. So what we do is we hold public demonstrations like protests, we like to use social media. So we do a lot of photography and videography and we do campaigns running like that. And so we get our pictures on the newspapers and on our websites and Facebooks and Instagram just to get that message out there. We've been developing educational curriculums to bring into the schools so we can have a student to student conversation because we know there is some sort of um, like hierarchy and age but it's hard to get across to younger people when they feel as if they're being lectured to. So we think that having a kid to kid conversation is going to be really good for that next generation of students. That's so true. I love that it's, you know, a lot of different schools, because sometimes if you're in school, you can only join the club at that school and it's not the same. So that's, that's a wonderful idea. And um, led by students also, because there is a disconnect with the age, you know, having a conversation with each other is, much more user friendly for the person having the conversation than somebody coming in. Great idea. So DJ, tell us a little bit about your involvement. Um, why did you join this organization? Uh, thank you for asking me that question, Andy Natasha. Um, so basically I'm the vice president, Ben's the president. Um, and we actually ended up taking over the organization after the founders had to pursue other academic endeavors, whether it was university, or they may have gotten a different opportunity to pursue what they really wanted to um, in life. So the organization was kind of left without any leaders and we were asked to take it over. So Ben took it as the president and I am his right hand girl. <laughs> so um, yeah, so basically we just kind of like head everyone and give them guidance. I feel like it's not really, we don't really give them it's not a dictatorship, it's more of a democracy where people can kind of choose what they want to do. Um, and within our organization, we have three main branches. So there's outreach where we're collaborating with a lot of the organizations on island, um, whether it's older organizations or younger. Um, it doesn't even have to be in the environmental field. It can be like mental health um, because mental health and the environment do go together. Um, then you have social media, which is obviously something Ben mentioned before. That's how we broadcast our campaigns and educate people about the issues that are happening on island. Um, that's our main source. And then our last one is 
So outreach, social media, and Ben, please remind me of the last one. Education. Education. So what Sorry. I, mean. <laughs> I had like a little moment there. But um, yeah, in that group right now, they are, like Ben mentioned before, they're creating an environmental educational programs for the different um, schools on island, both public and private. And we're trying to cater to the younger kids and create different activities and um, showings of why the environment's important and why we should take care of it so it can last longer um, as humans have done a lot of damage. So, you know, we're just trying to make sure that the younger generation, they understand. So when they grow up, they can teach those that are left behind. Lovely. And I love, again, you said collaborating with different organizations. So it's not everything environmental yeah. elements and, you know, mental health is every topic. It's right. wide. Um, so that's great. And then the younger, the better, because once they start <laughs> yeah. in that way, um, it's much easier to carry on. Um, all right. So as I go to Eleanor, uh, do you have a figure like how many members do you have in your in your group? Yeah, so in total, it's probably about 60 to 65 students around island. And then in the school of Dijane I go to, it's about 30 kids. And then it's it's pretty evenly separated. It's kind of, Dijane school has the highest representation. Then there's a sep- second school called Cayman Prep that would have another like 15. Yeah. And then it's scattered five to 10 around all other schools. Super. Well, that's a that's a good a great number to, to get active on a on a small island. Sorry for calling you a small island, but you know Jamaica already. You know how we stay <laughs> going to Jamaica now in the lovely is it sunny down in Kingston there, Eleanor? It is today, thankfully. <laughs> We're so glad we've had so much rain. Not as bad as you had it over the weekend, King Man. Um but so Eleanor, tell us a little bit about your the team that you are involved with, Jamaica Climate Change Youth council tell us that please sure so jamaica climate change youth council we started in 2017 we are a group of young volunteers um our primary goal is raising awareness about climate change especially among young people but not just among young people and really kind of creating a space for climate action for young people that are interested in um you know doing something that a lot of young people are interested but they don't really know where to go or where to start so we kind of try to provide that space for them um our age group is 15 to 35 so um late high school university students recent graduates young professionals um i mean we say we stop at 35 but you know if you're young at heart we don't discriminate um and our membership we we have people from all walks of life and i think that's very important in the climate conversation because it's not just an environmental issue so we do have people working in the environmental field and then we have engineers we have people in marketing and PR because it's all a holistic approach to raising awareness about climate change so um that's kind of us in a nutshell um and what may i ask eleanor you you how you began or how you started was actually asking is anybody out there interested in doing something for the environment tell us that story okay so um i'm a phd student at the university of the west in Mona, and i previously worked with professor dale weber um on some projects when i was on the guild um and i found out that he was the chairperson of the climate change advisory board in jamaica he was appointed at the end of 2016. so i reached out to him i asked him you know is there any way that young people can get involved in climate action? And I was asking more on an individual level, you know, what could I do? Um, are there any projects that I could really take part in? Um, basically, he told me that the advisory board was really looking to form a youth council. Um, and I should find out if young people are actually interested in, before we even, you know, start a, a council, you know, is it something that young people want? So, um, spoke to someone else and we posted on Twitter and Facebook just you know would you be interested very general um and that first day we had 88 responses just on the first night which kind of was the the kind of kick for me it was like okay we have young people interested we've already started to just by asking if they're interested we've already started the engagement um and I, I don't I didn't want to be the person that you know got the people engaged and then kind of left them hanging so we organized ourselves we got ourselves together we came up with our organization structure we appoint um, assigned roles um, and that's basically so as I said we launched in April of 2017 so we're just we're kind of young we're just about 
three years old. Um, we're registered as an NGO and a nonprofit. Um, and yeah, we're completely voluntary. And how many, how many members do you have? Well, um, so we have about 30 active members in Kingston area, but then we have, um, so we have a lot of people like in Mobe, we have people in Mandeville, so we have them spread out. So I think all in all, I mean, we, we have, we have probably maybe 150, like in our database, but in terms of active members, because you know how it goes. Um, I would say um, right. <laughs> many people, but active members. <laughs> yeah, we know that. Okay, super. So, and again, another not attached to a school or an organization or a political party. It's it's just something that we're interested in and we want to we want to do something excellent. So the similarity, the similarities are there between between the two groups. So, all right, I want to ask each of you a project that your team has done that you would say you're most proud of. Um, let's start with Eleanor. Let's keep it in Jamaica and then we'll zoom back over to the Cayman Islands. Okay, so the project that I think uh, I am most proud of is a project that we're actually still undertaking now. Um, I think it's our first major project is, uh, if we're going on scale in terms of um, cost. It is the Albion Heights Green Community Project. Albion Heights, it is a rural community in St. Thomas. Um, they don't have JPS, so they don't get electricity. They're not hooked up to the grid. Um, a lot of people aren't hooked up to the water system. And even the people that are, um, water isn't, it's very infrequent, maybe every couple of weeks. Um, they don't have good garbage collection. So what we wanted to do was sort of um, fix some of these problems, but do it in a sustainable way. So going into the community, we have distributed recycling bins and given them disposal and we set up a recycling program where they can collect their bottles and it be collected by recycling partners of Jamaica um, and then that will also generate funds that the community can then put into other activities for themselves. We are also putting in solar street lamps because as I said there's no electricity up there um, there's no street lighting up there which you know is a security issue so we're putting in solar street lamps we are putting in rainwater harvesting systems for the households and for some persons we're going to be going in and um installing solar technology within their homes so that's kind of it in a nutshell so um practical all of those <laughs> the lights the water the comp and then the collaboration recycle partners of jamaica they're awesome they will if you call and have 20 bags or more they will collect right, right. and they'll start doing it regularly that's super. And you can see it, the, the community coming to life, really. And I, th I think that that for me is the most heartwarming part, because I think at first, even though we had the idea and we had spoken to the community members, I was a little bit, you know, nervous about the buy-in, you know, how they would feel. But they're, they're so enthused. They've really taken on this project for themselves as a community activity. And that's what we really want to see, because at the end of the project life, we still want the community to be able to uphold themselves as a sustainable community and, and this doesn't seem to this community as a green project this is a lifestyle project right. we need exactly. life so it's kind of taking it away from oh environment to life that's that's a great one all right so ben or dj who, who'd like to share the best project that you've had with your with your club so far i mean i can jump in with it i think dj and i will have the same answer yeah um and i think our best and our biggest project really was the Cayman government had proposed a new cruise ship birthing facility. That's what they branded it as. And um, it was right in the heart of our island. It was Georgetown Harbor, which is home to probably about 35 world renowned dive sites. So that's the first issue right there. Second issue really was that it, it originally was proposed to remove 68,000 square meters of seabed, which in the scheme of an ocean seems like it's not very big, but when you really take a holistic perspective of it, when you remove 68,000 square seabeds, it's not just that area, right? You're in water. So that sediment that rises settles on the surrounding reefs. So essentially what would happen is all the reefs that surround came in were going to be covered in sand and they were going to eventually begin to die off. And so Dejay and I and our mentor, like one of our teachers, Mr. Bill, spent a long time really just doing that research and seeing what the environmental effects were. And also something that was big to acknowledge was the economic effects, the amount of job losses that were going to uh, occur in the ecotourism related sector. Because I know 
everybody here understands living on islands, a lot of the jobs revolve around our environment and where we are and what we do. And even the cultural aspect, which is something DJ really focused on as well as Cayman is very water oriented. Like our national holiday is conch season and lobster season. You know what I mean? It's like you grow up. Exactly. Pirates week. You grow up on the water and in these reefs. So the removal has a lot of effects on who we are. So we kind of tackled that issue with a lot of different ways. We made huge bed sheets and we painted protect our reefs, protect our future. And we, because I'm a free diver and a couple of my buddies are too. So we swam them down to the bottom of these reefs and we took pictures and we sent those out everywhere. So people could see how alive these reefs really were. The visuals were awesome. Exactly. I saw them on your website. It, when you see that, that they're like, wow, that, that was a great, that was a creative idea that, you know, instead of, you know, on the street with a little, well, in Jamaica, we'd have to look at cardboard, that made an impact in the area that you want to protect. I must commend you for that. Thank yeah, you. Carry on. How did you feel when, so what changed, what happened? So we had those, we had two protests, which were definitely the scariest things we did because there's so much uncertainty going into that. You don't know if anybody's going to come or what's going to happen, but we had about 300 people show up to each one, which is really good for a small island like came in. And we had them in the port pretty much. So it was kind of like a slap in your face. Like we are here. We don't want this to happen. And eventually what this led to was a referendum. And so what a referendum was is like X amount of signatories brings this whole project back to a revote and the legalities behind it. And eventually the government made the final decision that this project was unconstitutional and the way they went through it. So it can't happen. So that was kind of the biggest thing for us is we spent probably about a full year fighting on the same project, doing the same things, having all these meetings, radio interviews. We finally saw like tangible change. Ah, so did you have somebody guiding or helping you the political side, like getting the signatures, who was the right person in the government that it needs to go to and all of that? Yeah. So the political side was something Dejay and I had to spend a long time looking into because it's very hard to learn politics in two months and then try to reproduce it. So there's an organization that founded as well side by side with us when this was all happening called Cayman Port Referendum or CPR. And so they were almost solely the political aspect. Great. So they brought up the issues that deemed this unconstitutional. They sat in court with the government getting these things removed and changed. And this was students also? No, these were actual professionals. This became people's full-time jobs. And so that's what was difficult for Dejay and I, right? Like we're going to high school, we play sports, Dejay dances, like we've got all this stuff going on. So we couldn't dedicate our whole lives to figuring out the issues in the laws that are in the fine but print. I love that you, you know, created a whole nother club and group of persons who this is what they're they're now doing. It's it's great. And the the all of you'll know when you have a successful project, when I do my awesome beach cleanups, you know, how you feel when you heard it's not gonna happen, or when you see the face of somebody in St. Thomas Street, like it's it's overwhelming, you know, that you know you've been a part of that. So I'm glad that you're feeling that from this age because it will really keep your passion going for years and years. That's that's a great story. Um, with you know, so you have adults guiding or or suggesting things with you. What are we missing, DJ? What do you think adults are not getting about the whole environment issue? Well, from a kid or a child or use stand of point um a lot of the time when we're providing information to the public mm -hmm. or like stating our stand of point on a political issue such as the cruise port ref um facility birthing facility uh we're told that we're stupid and we don't know what we're talking about and we don't have any brain cells and that people are feeding us and telling us what to say when in actuality, we're sitting down for hours on top of hours on top of hours of um, researching and finding out, you know, what's really going on. You know, um, one of our things is we always want to really find the truth behind what is actually happening. Um, there's a lot of development on islands. So we always want to know, like, was this legal? Was this illegal? You know, kind of things like that. So um, that's a lot of the things that adults would that, say because we're children 
to me sounds like bullying. <laughs> you know what? That um, is the definition of you're stupid. You don't know anything. Oh, yeah. The fact. That's that is. Um, sometimes so I feel like it's kind of a Caribbean thing where you have to respect your elders. So you, sometimes you can't really say your point of view, especially because it goes against what other people think. Um, but then, but just, as an adult, as a parent, we're trying to bring up children to yeah. be vocal, to be outspoken, tell yeah. us their passions, and we guide them into, you know, doing these things. But that's, wow, that's a great lesson. Yeah, because I've, I've, I've had this from family members that have literally called my mom, especially when we were doing the project. They were like, why is she doing this? Like, why are her teachers feeding her this? Like, you need to tell her that she needs to stop and yeah. I didn't stop <laughs> um, and I'm happy I didn't um, but I'm also lucky that I, I have a support system especially my family that do support me and um, they believe in the work that I do especially when I show them the, the evidence that we have spent hours looking for researching so do you think Eleanor tying it into a Caribbean perspective do you think it's it's a bit of a Jamaican Caribbean, a Caribbean thing that why what these young people what they know or what um, what I don't know if it's a Caribbean thing or just a global thing, but I, I have also experienced the same thing in Jamaica, especially on social media. Um, young people are lazy, we don't care. Um, and it's, it's not just the young people, I also get the quote unquote environmentalist hate, which is that environmentalists, we just want to save the trees and we don't care about the people. Um, and I think it goes back to your question about what adults are not getting is that I really don't think that we're making the linkages between the economy and our environment. Um, it's always a trade-off where we choose the economy over the environment, but there really is no economy without the environment. And it's it's not a, we're not environment, well, I don't, personally don't use the term environmentalist, but even that we're not environmentalists because we want to save the planet. We are environmentalists because we want to save people. And I think that that distinction is really what a lot of people, it's not, I don't know if it's not translating. I'm not sure if it's because adults think that you know they'll be gone by the time that climate change it won't them. matter to us it won't matter I, i'm not sure why but um i can definitely relate to some of the comments about young people yeah. um and environmentalists within and the space possibly just changing the language so it's not like oh there's an environment talk there's a life talk there's an right. economic talk there's a you know so people don't know it's that i won't bother to listen type of thing interesting all right i'm gonna pause for a cause we have a poll to do and we're going to ask our participants, do our Caribbean youth groups, any type of group, need to be more active and vocal on environmental issues? So do you think, answer in the poll that's on the Zoom, do our Caribbean youth groups need to be more active and vocal on environmental issues? Maybe we'll change the name of it. <laughs> so not just youth groups, but everybody will get involved. I um, might give that a few more seconds. It's a resounding 100%. And I think we can agree that the answer is, I'm going to share the results there. I love it. I love when we get 100%. <laughs> Do Caribbean youth groups need to be more active and vocal on environmental issues? And the answer is 100% of participants absolutely yes so we love to hear that and I think if we were in you know in the dance club in the maths club in the different clubs at schools we're talking about environment as well and not just in the environment club it would it would definitely uh, make a big difference lovely thank you for the results from that poll so um, another in terms of climate change the, the term or climate crisis. Um, do you think, Ben, I'm gonna ask you this first. Do you think the Caribbean countries get it and understand that it is something that is impacting the Caribbean? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't know. I think the whole global perspective around climate change is quite controversial because it, the science is there. And I think everybody sitting on this panel would agree with it. I think it's just hard to assess the Caribbean because there's so many different factors that go into our decisions in development, right? Islands are confined like to space, the space we have. Cayman, if you look at it in an aerial, aerial perspective, and I've looked at the maps on mangrove development, like there is significant development going and people 
I think some people are cognizant of the effects and the fact that that is causing climate change and we're producing all this carbon dioxide. And I think there is a lack of education as well. And so I think the only way I could answer that really is saying there's a balance between people who understand and people who don't understand. And I think that's why there's so many education groups is just to pursue that. But I think a way in which Dejay and I have talked about getting the um, information about climate change out is not speaking solely from an environmental perspective and talking about how our environmental decisions impact other aspects of life. And so a lot of our work, we had to, we had to speak about the fact that we understood the, the economic value in development and that there's a balance and like, when push comes to shove, one thing has to go and one thing has to stay. And if you want a society that does thrive, there has to be some sort of economic gain there. Yeah. And so I think people are very, very materialistic focused. And I think if there's a lot of development that goes on and people want to continue going forward. So finding a way to teach the Caribbean islands that there, there can be a sustainable and healthy balance is something that's not present now, but it, it can happen soon. So, Eleanor, I'm going to do this little follow-up question with you because, you know, we say education and teach. Do you think as a young person, you've done up to your PhD, bright girl, um, is it just education in schools to young people? What do you um, think about this term educating people on it? Um, I, I think the term is much broader than school and I just think that as education on a whole we don't stop being educated when we leave school um, I do think that it's very important that we have the education in schools I think what we need to move more towards is sort of institutionalizing that education a little bit more within our curriculum you know integrating climate change a lot more I know it happens in other countries but it's not really happening here in Jamaica um, but beyond that we also have to be looking at social education and educating the wider population. I mean, even as though as a youth group, our focus is young people, our awareness campaigns are still for the general public. Um, and we take that approach because we hope that, you know, children will go home and to annoy their parents to, to recycle and, and, you know, tell their friends. And we're, we, there, that is one way to get the message across, but it, that's not the only way to get the message across. And I think that because you know, there are a lot of groups in the space. Not everybody has to, you know, necessarily tackle the exact same niche or use the exact same approach. I think it can be more of a collaborative effort um, to get the message in all the spaces that we can. That's excellent. I, I really feel we, when we say education, we think, oh, it needs to be in a book in a primary school. But that's not, it, it, I love what you're saying, get in all spaces everywhere. I just want to read a comment that's coming um, from Christy. Thank you, Christy. Um, DJ, keep advocating your research and utilize online sources to get your point heard. I'm very impressed with Ben's knowledge of the environmental concerns of his island. And then there was one for Eleanor. Um, so kudos for the Cayman team was another comment here. Um, Open Society Foundations are looking to support activism for climate justice in the Caribbean. Um, and then Christy, again, it's a shame that youth's perspective is not being taken seriously, which is so true. Um, so there's a, another couple of Facebook um, as well. And okay, so the poll, thank you for bringing that up about regarding, do you think you're being taken, youth are being taken seriously? And I think we know which way this poll is gonna go. So quickly answer that if you're in the Zoom. The question is, are they being heard and taken seriously, are youth? All right, a few more seconds. <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> All right, and the results there with a massive 86% feel that no, the youth are not being heard and taken seriously. And a small 14% um, believe yes, they are. So what do you think then, um, youth? What can you do? personally through your groups? Give me one action that you would do to get taken seriously. Let's start with you, Dejay. Uh, like Ms. Christie said, um, making sure you do have that research, which I feel like POF has really gotten down since we've 
um, started. Um, and you can see them in all the articles that we have on the Compass and CNS where we just keep on spitting out facts um, about the projects that we're doing, whether it's about the mangroves or the reefs or overdevelopment. Um, one thing people can't go against are facts. So that's one thing that I feel like would solidify um, the adults' opinions about what we're seeing. Yeah, and it's great for you as well because you never know, you might be going down a route that, you know, that might end in your career or you'll find something that's like, oh, that's really interesting. And that could be from this action, that could be your, your life's work. Eleanor, what do you think for us Jamaican people? What one action could you take? I think we need to take a page out of the my friends from Cayman's book and make some noise and protest and have a little civil action. I think that, um, you know, and it's been said to me, young people, we're not really militants about this issue. And I think that, you know, we're not really taken seriously because we have the conversations in our space, but then we're not doing anything to hold our government accountable for their actions. So I think from our point of view, and um, especially when we've been really thinking about crafting our advocacy going forward, because we want to make sure that we're making the most impact. And I think that, you know, sometimes you have to make a little good trouble. I think that you have to kind of force people to listen to you sometimes. So that is where I'm at. And as a mother, I'm like, no, trouble. But I love it. Good trouble. <laughs> Um, and you do possibly make a little noise, agitate a little to get to get some attention. Um, you have energy, you have masses, you have numbers, you have interest. Um, so, so why not? All right. So there, there's a third poll that I want to ask because there's quite a, a hefty question about this. And I really would like your opinions about shopping habits. And do you think how we shop plays a role in environmental degradation. So think about that while we ask the poll. Whoa, the poll's shooting up. <laughs> I haven't even asked the question. Do you think our shopping habits play a role in environmental degradation as Caribbean nations? All right, oh, okay, I'm gonna finish the poll right now because it has finished. Everybody, <laughs> it whipped to 100% again. I'm really, you know, I'm not surprised, but it's amazing to see that. And again, we're kind of preaching to the converted so everybody on the call and in the panel we know these things <laughs> do you think our shopping habits play a role in environmental degradation 100 percent of the persons on this call today say absolutely yes all right so ben let's go to you and give us your perspective in cayman how do you think how does shopping cause a cause an issue for the environment there <clears throat> I think there's there's three branches that have to be seen here and there's there's the consumer which would be your shopping habits and the people who are buying these plastic items and using like non-environmentally friendly items then there's the producer which are the companies that are creating these items so who are using unsustainable practices and unsustainable materials and then there's the legalities behind them so the law is set in place and what happens there and so I think each three are quite balanced in their effects into the environment. And so, yes, the items you buy and the lifestyle you choose to live has a serious impact on the environment. And I think that that's a fact and it's undeniable is if you solely drink water from plastic bottles, you're producing an extreme amount of waste. And there is nowhere that waste can go unless you have really well-established recycling facilities. And even then they're not really recyclable. Um, and I think that's one aspect of the field though. I think changing your behavior and lifestyle choices has a greater effect. And I think there is that, that quote unquote domino effect in the sense that everybody who's surrounded by you, your close tight knit circle of people will eventually begin to change their behavioral practices, which is really good because you have this almost paradigm shift of mentality behind plastics in specifics, but styrofoam and just unsustainable practices in general. But if there isn't those other two factors, that legality and that producer change, I don't think we really can create a sustainable environmentally friendly um, culture ecosystem, because if companies are still producing these goods and they're still feeding into the markets that are creating the plastics, then you're still going to have a constant demand for it. So it's that supply and demand balance. Exactly. And I think I, 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 Deshay and I put a lot of heat onto the government in Cayman for environmental changes, but I think I'd have to acknowledge the fact that they have um, put into place in 2021, I believe April of 2021, they've agreed to ban five 
different single, single use items, which is a huge step for us, right? Because then that forces that consumer change, which is really good for us. And, you know, I agree, you know, as I'm sipping from my reusable straw in my, you know, it used to be, oh, Auntie Tasha, you know, yeah. And people tease you and that you look a little bit crazy. You're walking around with these reusable bags. Um, and now it's a bit of a trend, but, you know, are people changing their lifestyle habits to do it or just when they're out or when they're taking their selfie on social media? Um, I really agree with you, Ben. If you're with groups of persons who all do that, you know, you pop out your reusable cutlery, nobody's laughing because everybody's popping it out at the same time. So what do you what do you think in Jamaica, Eleanor, regarding the, the shopping habits for a small island as we are? Um, I agree with pretty much everything that Ben said. He said it a lot better than I could. Um, and we would have seen, um, we would have had our plastic ban implemented um, last year. So uh, that is a step. I don't think it's a big enough step, but it's a step. And what it has done, it has forced people to use reusable bags. So I just think that, you know, that kind of action of forcing people into change. But I think even outside of Jamaica, and I'm guilty of it as well, and a lot of us shop online and we use these big online retailers and then they send this little tiny item in this giant box with 500 pieces of plastic. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I try to keep my boxes and reuse them, but it, it's, it's a lot. Um, and, you know, I, it is cheaper to buy things online than it is within country but we also have to think you know a lot of times the local products are a lot more sustainably packed and and you, there's a lot more thought going into it and i guess even because they don't have to ship it overseas there's also that as well um okay. and it's just a we we really do have a, a consumerism we, we are a culture of consumerism we like to get things we like to throw them away we like to get new things and then we throw that away um so uh, yeah, as I said, Ben said it way better than I could ever. <laughs> no, I love, I love that you brought in the whole shipping, packaging, because we, ha it has to be shipped. If we're doing it online, it has to get here. And we haven't even talked about the fuel and, you know, the, either the airline, the ships, whatever is bringing it here um, as well. But it, it's so true. Um, Deje, what, what are your thoughts on that shopping um, and environmentalism? Yeah, I um had to do some online shopping especially because of the pandemic and I am a growing teenager so I needed some new clothes um, but I do know that there are some ways that we can kind of control or condense the amount of waste that we have there's these things called eco bricks I'm not sure if you guys know what they are but it's if you have like a plastic bottle it could be a Gatorade bottle or just a nasty plastic water bottle which we don't like <laughs> but either way it's a good way of just you just stuff all of the plastic that you have from like any sort of wrapping um and it basically condenses the amount of plastic in the environment because it's all in this this bottle um so yeah th there's different ways even though yes we may have to receive these plastics there's different ways about going about either reusing them or trying to condense them so there's not as much out in the environment itself um and we even do it at my school so it, it's been working and that can be used for construction art projects like games um that's one game that we had at our protest one time we had um eco bricks filled with plastic and it was like a almost like the x and o's game tic-tac-toe um mm -hmm. so yeah it, it it works so yeah i also see in the comments a lot of people say like you know um you could do like clothing swaps yeah. um stuff like that which is something we also do um here um so yeah there's a lot of things that can do to mitigate the waste that we have um but just don't throw it away um yeah. so just and the, and the list of ours reuse reuse recycle repair reuphold stuff you know, the refill, there's so many that, and a few of the comments that, that I'm reading as well. I love, I was, I'm the fourth of four girls. So I had hand-me-downs all my life. And I used to cherish, I'd see my big sister in a, a new dress. I'm going to get that one day. And I still have that now. My, my children get their cousins hand-me-downs. They're from Farin, so they get shipped to Jamaica and they love it. Um, but the hand-me-down thing is, is, is a real way of, I learned enough, caught last week that the amount of microplastics from washing synthetic 
fibers is just astronomical. So we have an, a question. So panelists, anyone can choose to answer this. How far this is from, oh, I'm not seeing who from. How far do you think the Caribbean is from zero waste shopping? And what do you think we need to do to get there? What are some good examples of best practices in zero waste shopping across the world? Ooh, that's a big one. So anybody wants to have a go at that? To jump in on the first, I think the first half of the question yeah. on how mm -hmm. far the Caribbean is from zero waste. Um, I think there are transitions and I'm just speaking from a, a Cayman perspective because I can see it here. There has been more emphasis on, on local shopping, which is really good. There's more farmers markets coming around. Their government has put money into actually an established farmer market instead of having tents pitched up. You know, they put like a concrete roof over it so you can go during the rain and you can still buy produce. May I just ask Ben quickly, was that COVID that caused that? Or was no, it? That was, that was pre-COVID. That was about two years ago. I think they started putting that money. Because I know in Jamaica, we had a, a lot and it was due to COVID. We had some before. Oh, that's interesting. All right, carry on. Um, but I think zero waste is sadly, I think it might be unobtainable for Caribbean nations. And I think we talked about it. And I think even for the smaller nations, especially with the shipping that's involved, it's going to be very difficult to have absolutely no waste. I think there's easy practices we can do to mitigate the waste that we use with the packaging that goes into what we're shipping towards us and the ways in which we sell the produce that we have and the items we're, we're um, selling. But I think there always has to be some sort of waste that's produced because it comes on boats and it comes on air. And I think that's the difficult part, but I think investing more into a more local based economy is it's going to be at least a step in the right direction, but it, it's, it's got a twofold benefit though, which is really good is it's putting more money into the economy of our local economy rather than outsourcing to bring things in. And it's also going to be way more environmentally friendly. So I think if somebody was asking on what practice I would recommend to at least just reduce to get closer to that zero waste, it would be to really put money just into the local consumer-based areas. But, you know, Ben, you could be an economist and secretly behind that, you're an environmentalist. But, you know, because <laughs> the way you look at things, you know, that's so practical and it's not to do with green. It's to do with your country being successful and having an economy because we're buying produce from right here. Um, and a comment is that Jamaica from Christie is showcasing farming as a way to, to grow and consume crops naturally which is great for the environment, but also it's keeping the money here also if we're, if we're, buying, if we're buying produce here. What do you ladies, Eleanor, um, DJ, think about the, the whole zero waste? Are, is the Caribbean close to it or do you think we're heading there? Is it possible? Uh, well, we're definitely not anywhere close. Um, I don't know if we're heading there. Um, I'm not sure if it's possible. Uh, I know that, you know, some of the models in other countries are like um, so items are sold in bulk. So you go into the grocery store and you have to carry your own bag to put your rice and the rice is just there in bulk. It's not pre-packaged. Um, I know that I think what we have to keep in mind is the culture that we have here and the context that we have here when we're designing our solutions. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure how well that might work in the Caribbean countries. It might work. I'm not saying it won't. Um, but, you know, in terms of of or solutions, I'm not sure if we can just apply the same solutions that are applied in more developed countries. I agree a lot with what Ben said about investing in our local economy um, and not just for waste, but also for our own food security because um, all of it ties back into sustainability at the end of the day. Um, so I, I do think that in terms of eliminating waste, the government or whatever action it needs to be taken, not at the consumer level, but at the producer and the distributor level. Um, because a lot of policies, you know, it's hard for people, but even with the plastic ban, a lot of people were complaining that they had to buy bags and they had to do this. Um, and I think if we have more enforcement at the higher levels and not put so much burden on the consumer, then it will do a lot in terms of just changing the entire system and it will be easier to get to low waste or zero waste. Yeah. So there would be a group, you know, there's a group of conscious persons who are doing it. 
then there's a group of they weren't so conscious but now they have to and then there's a group of anti who are well you're going to be fine if you do so hopefully exactly. doing that we, we would get everybody would get everybody on board um DJ, what are your thoughts zero waste going to come to the caribbean <laughs> um i'm hopeful i think it's possible but not right now um especially with what is going on in the world um, due to covid um i think that it's possible but we have to make sure that we continue on our environmental journeys in terms of continuing banning these plastics um like jamaica started came on is on our way but it's gonna take a lot of time for us to get there the cayman islands is a very um is very dependent on importation we do not produce a lot of our own resources um even just farms alone like yes we do get our peppers and our tomatoes and stuff like that but other things that we may be looking for cannot grow here you know so we do depend on importation from other countries and that is where a lot of it is coming from um and it's it's not really our fault you know but like both Eleanor and Ben said, it needs to start at the top, starting with the governments. There needs to be some sort of discussion. And I think what also needs to happen is instead of each Caribbean country starting on their own, we need to re like reunite as a region and help each other. Because if we don't help each other, we're going to struggle on our own, you know? So we're neighbors. Why, why aren't we on the plastic ban already, you know? Why are we two years behind you guys? We're right beside you. Like you guys are like an hour away plane ride, you know? So I think that is one thing as a region that we're missing. And even in the world in general, like we're not helping each other. And it's it's not, sometimes it's not deliberate, um, but it's some sort of selfish mentality sometimes like, oh, we're the first Caribbean country to do this. Or we're the first Caribbean country to do that, you know? So um, that's one thing as just a person in general not just as an environmentalist not as a student but just a person as a human being i think we just need to unite as one and help each other reach these goals that we want to reach to like a zero waste um world or region or caribbean i mean preach it <laughs> no, I, I love and you're a parent a proud parent says you come home with the passion and the energy and educating at home what everything, you know, what the environment, what's happening and solutions. And it really helps, you know, and another comment was, you know, would you youngsters be willing to travel, to go to other countries to compare initiatives and, you know, travel, I'd love to travel, not Zoom, but <laughs> literally go there, you know, spend time with, with each other's groups to learn what is you're doing, what your challenges. Already Eleanor said, you know, I like the research part of it. And, you know, so you could compare notes and, um, and pool your resources. I think that would be, that would be fabulous. Um, oh, our hour is so close to ending. We have about 10 minutes left. But I want to um, get your final thoughts as I scan through for any more questions. But um, what, you know, as we've all watched so many webinars and so many um, interviews over the past few months, but what nuggets or what would you like anyone who's on this today what would you like them to go away thinking about what would you like them to actually do when they leave this call it's monday afternoon here in jamaica but by monday evening what action would you like to see them taking um let's go eleanor we'll go to you <laughs> Should I go? okay all right um so I would like everyone on this call to first of all, just understand the urgency of the situation. Climate change is not a 10 years from no problem. It's not a 50 years from no problem. It's a no problem. It's a five years ago problem. Um, so it's not, it's not a future thing. We're here, we're living it. Action has to be immediate. Um, so first of all, understand the urgency. And second of all, I'd like everyone just to commit to taking one small step today. So before the end of the day, one small step to whether it's you're going to recycle your plastic, you, got, you have a bag of plastic, but I have a bag of plastic bottles in my kitchen that I'm going to go and take to the recycling center today, whether it's you start a compost bin, or even if it's not something physical, whether you join a climate action group, you get involved, you learn some more. It's just one thing before the end of the day um, that is a step in the right direction. 
Lovely, Eleanor, because I think some people are very overwhelmed and get a bit anxious. Like, oh my goodness, it's so that we can't save the world. I can't do anything. It's too much. You can if you start with a little step. And oh, we could say watching this has been your step for the day, but we want you to take another step. Another one, yes. <laughs> uh, but that's lovely. So realize that it's urgent. And and what I must say, Eleanor, I do appreciate about we know in Jamaica, we know how passionate you are about it and how educated you are about it, but you don't shove it down as you have to do this. The world is coming to an end and, you know, get people, oh my goodness. You, you just say, it, you listen, you understand, you hear from their perspective. And then you say, you know, just start small. But I am hearing the need for urgency is definitely, definitely there. Um, all right, Ben, what do you think? What would you like? One step that everybody should take at the end of this, of this call and one, just a little thing that they can go away thinking about as well. I think my step might be different to Dujay's and Eleanor's, but I think the biggest thing that I found was the most helpful for me getting really involved environmentally is just spending your own time without the influence of anybody else, just researching and reading into the projects because you can't fully formulate your own opinion on something without actually understanding what it is. And that was what took Dejay and I so long with the port project is we had to spend a long time to read, to see what side we were on and whether or not we really deemed this project negative or positive. And it's difficult for somebody to inflict change and to make their own actions if they don't actually believe in what they're doing. So what I would say is I would love for people just to hang up this call and to never use a plastic bottle again. But I think just, Look up into the news, read the environmental articles published, see what issues are going on, see the effects of plastics on the environment and see what you can do. And from that point onwards, you can start to make smaller steps on stopping, you know, your own consumer based areas or even going even a step further and advocating for change and creating your own initiative. I, I love that. But, and this is obviously what you two did in Cayman that made that huge successful project happen with the government is you researched it and you have the knowledge and you know it's no library and encyclopedia no it is it is at the you know tip of our fingers and we can audiobook we can video we can you know there's two minutes there's two hours there's so many ways we can access this information um, and I want to just acknowledge what the, the group is saying you know the Caribbean countries really we do we need to pool our resources you know, Ben has probably sat, researched all of this information. And in another Caribbean country, somebody's saying, no, I wonder if I'm just starting this, what, when it's been done already, you know, you could give them the list of, of resources and they could, they could go. So I love that as a nugget, um, go and research and read your topic. And I find always you do, after you read it, you go down the rabbit hole of, oh my goodness, and then you do get passionate. So you'll donate or you'll champion or you get on board somehow. That's great. A great advice. Um, DJ, what do you have as your as your point that you'd like us to go with? It's a combination of both Ben and Eleanor's. Um, I personally feel like you just have to start somewhere. If you don't start somewhere, when are you going to start? <laughs> you know, um, so whether that is actually taking the action to start a recycling system in your house or getting rid of all of the plastic items in your house through recycling, hopefully not throwing them away and making it go to a dump, um, but also research the sustainable ways you can keep up those systems that you may create within your household or within your workplace and then start conversations with people start talking to them and asking them about the decisions that they're making because um, something that I had struggled with before was the fact that I actually didn't see anything. And it's when I actually saw plastic on the road or that I was using a plastic utensil every day or that I was buying a plastic water bottle every day from the canteen that I realized like I was actually having an impact on my environment and not in a good way. Um, so start talking to people and once people see it, they'll never be able to unsee it. Um, so that's basically my advice for you guys. That's a great, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And then it's just in your, you know, when the plastic straw ban, and I hadn't been using plastic straws for years, 
And then, you know, everywhere you go and people are like, oh my gosh, straw, straw. And it's like, where did all these straws come from? They were there all the time, but you weren't seeing them. Um, that's great advice. And um, I love the conversations. And again, as Eleanor said, you know, you, you talk to people. Um, then if you come from a, a place of knowledge, then you can actually speak and say, well, you know, did you know that this is actually the real story or this is the side that you haven't seen um, because you have the information to have to have those conversations with. Um, in the chat, I want to just acknowledge that we're being asked, we'd love your email addresses, websites, et cetera, because they'd like to get in touch with you from different, um, different regions what they're, that they're coming in from. They want to connect many Caribbean countries so we can work together. They've loved the talk today. Um, we have a Guyanese youth advocate who wants to connect as well. Um, fantastic, because this is gonna this is gonna get you all really keep you busy. Um, Bahamas is coming in. They have a new NGO, Island to Island, that will be connecting oh the Caribbean to Atlantic to Canada in technology and environment and all and all manner of things. That's wonderful. Um, so they're coming in from all over the Caribbean. So ladies and gents and youth of the Caribbean environment, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Um, what do you think, you know, after this call, do you, I love, uh, Deje, I think you said it earlier, you feel hopeful. Um, give me one word to describe what, what you feel about the Caribbean, not just your country, um, and, and where we're heading environmentally. So I, I'll say hopeful because somebody said it already. I'll give you here an option. Give me a word. Ben, go for it. United. Nice. And definitely, I think this call is starting something. Um, Live Echo, it's their mandate to, you know, be more environmentally conscious in your business operations and all that you do. But um, if we were more united as countries in the region, I think that would make a, a big difference. Um, Deje, what do you have? I think the youth are going to become more enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. Can you get any more enthusiastic? <laughs> you know, the passion and the interest. And I love when I see a youth group, you know, beside a not so young group and just the energy and the passion. And I think, okay, is it they're tired of the topic why they're not so passionate or they've been doing it for such a long time and haven't seen success yet, but um, definitely being energized, keeping the energy up. Um, it, it does motivate the, the other end of the spectrum to take action too, I must let you know. And Eleanor, what would be your, what would be your one word? Um, I think I'm going to go with militant because I was told we're not militant enough and my Cayman friends are very militant. So I, I'm going to go with militant. <laughs> and what would your dad say about that? <laughs> he would agree. He would 100% agree. Because he he's another, he's a great environmentalist and has done so much work for Jamaica and the region. Um, actually, with um, free on with all manner of, of things. So uh, I guess it's in, in your blood. The green <laughs> is going through your veins. Um, so we've had we've had calls from all over the Caribbean that have come in to really appreciate you. And I think holding the mantle up, going out there, doing the things that you do, um, giving you know, I think with Ben's research side, the energy, the interest side, learning new things is how I see. Um, DJ putting it in like I didn't see that or you bringing it home to families to make them oh I didn't think of it that way and then Eleanor in Jamaica really impacting communities not just as an environmentalist um, but showing them that these are things you need in your in your real life um, is, is really powerful so any last comments I uh, think we're actually on the on the hour it has been lovely so on behalf of Protect Our Future Ben and DJ thank you so very much and Eleanor, Jamaica Climate Change Youth Council, will be sharing your information to all the persons who are on the call. Um, but stay with us for the rest of the week. We have many different panelists and different conversations that have been happening. It has been wonderful having you. Thank you so much for, for coming in. Thank you so much. Well done. Bye. Thank you. Bye.